Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Worship, we have seen, is foundational for all of humanity. We have seen that there is a divine order. When we look at the various instruments, vessels, and what the Word of God says about them for this tabernacle worship, we see that God is a God of precision. That everything that He said, all this truth that was revealed, works together in order to position the people of God where they can worship Him. And as I've said many, many times, worship brings change, worship brings revelation, worship can bring a perspective, and worship can bring power into the disciple's life. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus as we begin this 31st chapter, the book of Exodus and chapter 31. Now, as I said earlier on, next week, God willing, we will complete this chapter. And the end of this chapter focuses, it is dedicated to the Shabbat. And I would say with, with all sincerity that we need to strive to understand Sabbath truth. And we need to further realize that there is still a day of sanctification, a day that God has anointed, that He has set aside, that He has commissioned in order that we rest and that we, in a unique way, experience Him. Well, we'll talk more about Shabbat next week, but let's begin the book of Exodus chapter 31, and we'll begin in the first verse. We read here, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called in name Bethsael. Now, we're going to discover that there are two unique men that are going to be named in this passage. And they are going to be commissioned, given, and they have already been prepared to serve God. And I want to lay that as a biblical truth. God calls, but even before He calls, He equips. And He positions that person whereby they are ready to serve God. So if you are a follower of Messiah Yeshua, realize something, that you have a call on your life to serve Him. And all too often, people neglect that. They ignore that. They, many are unaware of that. They simply incorrectly assume that if they have confessed the gospel and praised God for that, that's enough. I may write a check. I may go to services. I may read some scripture. I might do a few kind acts to others and that is spirituality. Well, that is far removed from the reality. We need to see that there is a call on our life that is going to greatly impact who we are. That call is going to bring change. We will never be the same people. We will be maturing spiritually, growing in the things of God and in every act of obedience, it is going to bring about a transformation in our life, moving us closer and closer to whom God wants us to be. So look at this passage. It speaks about God's personal knowledge of individuals, all people. He says, I have called by name 
Now, literally, it's Bashem, in name or with this one's name. I have called by name Betzael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now, Judah, that name speaks of giving thanks to God. It speaks of throwing, and this word means throwing in a lavish sense, not careless, but throwing praise upon God. That, that word can also be used, for example, in shooting an arrow from a bow. And the important thing to realize here is that there is a objective. There is a matara, we would say in Hebrew, a, a purpose, as I said, an objective. And therefore, when we give thanks to God, it is specific. When we worship God, there is a precision to it. It is not careless, simply like someone hunting. Now, obviously, hunting is not something that is done biblically. Hunting an animal with a bow or an arrow or a gun was not allowed under Torah law. But I'm giving an example. And that is if you're trying to shoot an arrow at a target, you don't haphazardly just shoot any place but you aim specifically. There's an objective, and that's what thanksgiving, worship, and praise is all about. So it's not by accident that the first person that's named here that is going to carry out the work. Now, we've had instructions, but the work has not been done. It has been given to us as a vision so that we have the right perception, but now, we see Betzael is being called by name. And this one we see here from the tribe of Judah. Notice what it says, verse 3. And I will fill him, Ruach Elohim, with the Spirit of God. Now, is the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit? Yes, he is. Different names, but speaking about that same and one and only Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And we see initially, at the beginning, how necessary the Spirit of God is for right, proper, God-pleasing worship. When we look at this passage of Scripture, the first thing that, that comes into my mind in this verse where it speaks about that this one, Betzael, he has been filled with the Holy Spirit. We see here that this Holy Spirit is foundational for worship. And it is the Spirit of God that brings order to everything, and that includes the worship experience. Order into even the preparation for worship because this one, Betzael, is going to be the leader. He's going to have the primary responsibility of carrying out Moses' instructions, the tavnit, what God gave to Moses in regard to this pattern for tabernacle worship. Look again at verse 3. I have filled him, the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding and judgment. And this word judgment is more related to discernment. We're not speaking about a judgment in condemnation or punishment, but we're speaking about making the right determination, the right decision. So it's related to discernment. And he has these three things. Look again, wisdom, and then we see understanding, and then finally, that ability to take wisdom and understanding and put them together in order that there is a righteous outcome, that the decision, the act, is one that is correct. Finally, he says, and in all may lacha, in all work. Now, there's two words for work. One is avodah, the second is malacha. This is melacha. 
And it speaks here about a, a worship, a service. But this service is specifically in regard to the labor in preparation for worship. Not worship, that can be avodah. But this is the, the laborious acts in regard to a preparation for something. So it underscores, it's foundational, this, this preparation that involves effort. It involves that which relates to labor. Now move to verse 4. All of this is for lakshov makshavot. Lakshov is for the thinking, and makshavot is thoughts. And the implication here is for thinking the thoughts. Now, this is, to me, highly important because he's given this wisdom, this understanding, this, this knowledge for right decisions, this discernment. He's doing the work and all of this. What he's provided gives him the ability to think thoughts, and it's a, a testimony to the work of the Holy Spirit in growing and maturing. It is going to, as he does this preparation, it is going to change the way he thinks. And I don't know you, but I know something about you because you're no different than me, and that's this. I need to change the way I think, and you need to change the way that you think. And worship imparts change. How we see things, it gives us, as I said earlier, a, a new, a different, a heavenly perspective. So to think thoughts, to make with gold and with silver, and here's this word, dachoshek, copper or bronze, and then four, look at verse five, and we see here, v'choreshet. Now, this is the word for, for a, a skilled individual, for in this case, it can be cutting, as we'll see in a movement, kind of chiseling wood. It could be engraving stone or sculpting, but it's a, an act. So he is going to be given intelligence, thinking, in order that he can work with gold, silver, and, and bronze or copper. And he is going to cut or engrave or sculpture this stone for the, and it says, le ma'ot. This is for the settings. Now, the word here comes from word le male, which is to make full. And what's happening is this. Actions are being called to be carried out. And the purpose, we can see this as the various settings for, for example, we talked several weeks ago about the breastplate of the, the high priest and the settings where stones were placed and other aspects of the construction. But all of this has to do with one thing, and that is that there is a, a reception of the very fullness of, of God. We need to, and the word I'd like to teach you in Hebrew is the word kli. We see many times it talks about the tabernacle, or excuse me, the table of showbread and its vessels, the Ark of the Covenant and its vessels, the menorah and its vessels and such. Well, when we speak about vessels, we're talking about a kli, an instrument. But this same word kli can be spoken of as a vessel for, for receiving something. And even though we do not come to worship to receive, we come to offer, to make a, a donation, a puma, a donation before the Lord. But in doing that, there's going to be a response from God and it's going to be in the full measure to bring about the change, and here's the key, that God wants made in our life. See, oftentimes we come before God and we say to God, God, change me, and this is how I want to be. I want to have this ability. 
I want to have this giftedness. I want to have the capacity to achieve this. This is not what, what the man of God or woman of God perceives. Whether we want God to make complete us for, and here's the key, for his purposes, his will. I realize that I say this a lot about his purposes, his will, submitting to his objectives. But this is something I'll make it very personal to me. I need to constantly hear that. And my, my assumption is, and I believe it's a right assumption, that you need to hear that too. Because the enemy, and who does the enemy attack more? Those who are non-believers or those who are believers? And the answer is simply the believers. And one of the things that the enemy continuously, constantly tries to do is to get us to think incorrectly about what pleases us. When he gets us to pursue what pleases us, he's in charge. It is only when we are pursuing that we are following after. Remember what we talked about last week, about being bent. It's only when we are turned to the things of God that God is going to be in our life in a way that he is manifesting his power. Now, he promises never to leave us nor forsake us, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be under the anointing and, and receiving his provision for his will. We won't if we're not committed to his will. So we read, for the cutting of stone, for the settings, and the cutting of wood to make with all types of of labor, bekol melacha, verse 6. And I, behold, I am setting or placing with him another individual, a man by the name of Aholiav, Aholiav, the son of Ahi Samach, from the tribe of the tribe of Dan. So we have something here. We have Two and only two tribes mentioned here in the passage that we're studying. The tribe of Yehuda, Judah, and the tribe of Dan. Dan means judgment, and here's the key. Yehuda relates to worship, praise. And Dan relates to, as I said, judgment. And it's only when we are praising God, worshiping God, giving thanks to God, recognizing God through his objectives, pursuing his purpose, as one shoots an arrow from a bow at a specific objective, then and only then are we going to be the recipient of discernment so that we can render right judgment in our life, make those right decisions. So that's what worship brings about in a person's life. It gives us the ability to discern things from, here's the key, from God's perspective. And that's why worship today is under, and it's nothing new, but I believe the enemy is having much greater success than in the previous decades. We have seen worship turn away from a emphasis on the Word of God, on Psalms, on scriptural songs, as we see in the New Covenant about making a joyful melody with songs and Psalms and spiritual melodies. We have turned that into all too often worship being man-centered, being used to attract individuals. Go to this congregation because the worship there is great. Says who? According to whose standards? This is the problem. Worship needs to be under the authority of the standards of God. We're not so much interested about what we get from it, but what we offer to the Lord that he's pleased, and if he is, he is going to go to work in our life to bring about pleasing changes in us and give us his righteous perspective. Look again at Verse, verse 6, 
And I, behold, I am setting with him Aoliav, the son of Achisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And this next point, and I would just encourage you to, to compare Scripture. Now, you can do that with, with the Bible study company. You can do that with Bible Hub or the Discovery Bible. Lay out different versions, different translations of the Scripture. And when you come here to this section, after it speaks about this man that we encountered here, uh, Oliav, you're going to see this phrase where it says, Uv lev ko chacham lev natati chokma. Now, the words are not difficult Hebrew. There are times, for example, many times in our study of the book of Psalms, the, the vocabulary, the grammar is difficult. Same thing throughout the book of Isaiah. The poetry makes the language, the vocabulary, oftentimes choosing difficult words, synonyms that are not frequently appearing in the rest of Scripture. But, but here, the, the vocabulary is simple. But you'll notice when you look, some scriptures just give it a literal interpretation, but they give it a, a paraphrase. And what I mean is this. You look at some translations which are very literal for most of scripture. They come here, and they kind of give it a paraphrase. We ought not do that. But what does it say? Look again. It speaks about this man, oh, excuse me, Aho Liab, the son of Achim Masamach, of the tribe of Jan, and with a heart, Ko Chacham, Lev, with a heart, a heart of all wiseness or wisdom, but it's unique, this word. I will set or place wisdom, chokhmah. So there's a difference between an adjective, chacham, and a noun, chokhmah. But here, because of the use of the word chacham, it's very difficult to render this again with a heart, all wise heart, or every wise heart. He says, I will set wisdom. And they shall make all which I have commanded. So it's with wisdom, with a heart that is a heart of wisdom, that's a wise heart, that they are going to carry out and do the work that God has commanded. Verse 7. And this is all for the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. And the meeting speaks of, as we talked about last week, a, a designated time and place. If your Bible has the phrase congregation in it, it's incorrect. It's simply the tent of meeting. And who's going to be at the helm of this worship? As it says here, we're speaking about this, these acts that are going to be led by the priests. But at the helm of everything is, notice the first thing that's mentioned, Ha'aron la edut, the Ark of Testimony. Now, we're speaking about the Ark of the Covenant, Aron Habrit, but it's called here, as frequently it is, the Ark of Testimony. And the reason for that is because God appeared above the Ark of the Covenant. He bore testimony. This is where his presence was. So the whole point of worship is that God would be at the helm, that he would be leading, that his presence would impact everything that's done and the knowledge that truly he's among us. And my concern is that oftentimes what's being done for worship gives no thought or consideration concerning God, his will, his commands, what he would think if he was there in the very presence of the people. So you do this 
And he says, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the kaport, that is the, the mercy seat, that covering for the ark of the covenant, which is upon it and all of the vessels of the tent. So all the vessels for the tent of meeting, that is the tabernacle, verse 8. Now we're going to find out what vessels we're speaking about. We're speaking about the shulchan, that is the table of showbread and its vessels, and also ha menorah, ha torah, the pure menorah. Now this is unique because the menorah is called the pure torah, the pure menorah. And it could be a relationship between the gold is pure gold or the oil that is used to kindle the menorah is pure olive oil, sa, meaning pure and, and clean, not having anything within it, only olive oil. And what does this menorah do? Well, we mentioned in our earlier studies of it that there's a, a unique relationship between the Ark of the Covenant and the menorah. Both. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood covered with this pure gold, while the menorah was only gold. And we said that the menorah confirms, its light confirms the presence of God in his, with his people in the city of Jerusalem among the congregation of the children of Israel. And notice that purity is, is placed within this description. And it's purity that, that can assure us when I'm walking in purity. My speech is pure, my thought is pure, and for our purpose today, our worship is pure. That we can expect God's presence to be with us. Verse, verse 8, the second part. And all of its vessels, meaning all the vessels of the menorah and the altar of incense, verse 9, and the altar of the burnt offering with all of its vessels, and in the verse 9, what we talked about last week, and also the basin, this, this kind of, of fountain where there was water for the cleansing of one's hands and feet, and it mentions here not just the basin, but its, its foundation, its base. Verse 10. And the big day, ha sharad. Now, this is important. Here it's ha sharad. And here again, many times this word is confusing. I believe if you go to uh, some of the primary helps that I mentioned to you, uh, the Bible study company, Bible hub, and such, and you click on this, they'll say this word is of an unknown origin. It's not. It's the same word, if I said the word misrad, everyone in Israel would know that we're talking about an office. You go to work, and many people, they work in an office. They have their own personal office. And this word for, for misrad, it speaks about service. So it's the close of their office that relates to their calling, their position, and relates to their service. Also, the holy garments of Aaron, the priests, and the garments of his son. Sons, the regular priests, not the high priest Aaron, but the regular priests, his sons. Lekahen, to serve, to act as priests. And now verse 11. And verse 11 is going to be our last verse to see me because when we get to verse 12, we're speaking about the Shabbat. And I'm going to save that for a, a in-depth study of Shabbat next week. But look at verse 11. And the anointing oil and the incense spices for, now this could be for holiness for sanctification or for that holy place. And it's according to, and this is what's important, and we'll finish with this, 
Notice we're speaking about worship. This first part of Exodus 31 gives us a general understanding of worship. And here's what we learn. Look at the last part of our study tonight, the end of verse 11, where it says, Kehol asher siviticha yasu. It says here, according to all which I have commanded you, they shall do. Who's the you? Moses. God is saying to Moses personally, according to all which I have commanded you, Moses, they, who's that? The priests, they shall do and bringing the rest of the children of Israel into submissiveness. Twice we see here at the end of verse 11, this all which I have commanded you, but if we read on, we also see at the end of verse 6 that, that same expression. At ko asher seviticha, all which I've commanded you. And this simply tells us that it is impossible to worship God if we're not submitting to his instructions. Worship foundationally, biblical worship is always about us submitting to the instructions of God, resting in his will, carrying out his instructions so that his presence, his power, his anointing, his illumination, his revelation, his provision for change and for right perspective will be given for his people. Well, I'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you as you strive to worship him in spirit and in truth. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.